Food is more than just what's on our plate. It's the places where it's grown, it's the people who grow it, and so much more. Join me, Janice Person, your host, on Grounded by the Farm every other week as we talk about the foods we love. And here we are with another episode on holiday foods, and we're going to Wisconsin, and we're talking about one of our Native American fruits. That's the cranberry. And we're going to talk about how it's grown and everything. Amber Bristow is our guest, and she grows for ocean spray. So you can actually see her looking a lot like those commercials, but she helps us get far past those commercials and understand some of the other things that are going on with cranberries. Not only how it's grown, but she shares a lot about sort of craisins and other uses of cranberries that maybe all of us don't think about. And she and I compare recipes a little bit. We're gonna have those recipes, some videos. She's got a great Instagram channel. So we'll have some of those photos and all on the blog at groundedbythefarm.com. I was so excited to find Amber on Instagram. (laughs) (laughs) There aren't very many cranberry farmers, are there? No, there's not. You guys are an elite bunch, I think, Amber. We're a unique brand. (laughs) All right. (laughs) I'm going to suggest there aren't a lot of cranberry farmers out there. So can you tell me sort of how many farmers there are like you? And you're one of the only ones on Instagram, I assume. (laughs) But where do we find cranberry farmers? Most of the cranberry growers are found in Wisconsin. We produce over half of the world's supply of cranberries, which is humble brag. (laughs) I'm not exactly sure the total number of growers in the state, but there's quite a few. Other top producing states are out in Massachusetts. They're second in line and kind of out east in that area in Massachusetts, New Jersey, also in Washington state. And then there's a few growers up in Canada and actually recently down in Chile there's a few growers that are popping up down there too. So mostly Wisconsin is a top producing state. We'll we'll just leave it at that. (laughs) I love it. Cheese heads and cranberries. That's what Wisconsin has going for it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I've always thought of cranberries as inextricably American foods. And I remember going to Italy, gosh, a million years ago, it seems, for friends to visit them at Thanksgiving. And they had me bring cranberries and cranberry sauce. Is it really like an American native plant or something? Yeah, so cranberries are one of the, I think, four native fruits to North America, along with the blueberry concord grape, and I think now strawberries just got added into that mix as well. So they were found growing wild here in Wisconsin, and we found a way to cultivate them and turn it into the industry that it is today. So we still have a few wild cranberries growing out in our marshes, that we can find before the critters get to them. So that's pretty cool. That's a really unique thing to be really proud of. Yeah, it's interesting. I didn't even think of what you would call them. They're not fields. You call them marshes. What's farming cranberries look like? Oh, it's a year-long process, kind of like any other type of farming. Usually our busiest seasons are obviously harvest. That's kind of the image that people are really familiar with, with, you know, the guy standing out in water. (laughs) That only happens during harvest time. Cranberries actually don't grow in water. <laughs> um, so they're a perennial plant as well. So they, they require they require year-round care. So it's it's busy all year round for us. All right. Do you plant cranberries each year? You said it's a perennial. Mm-hmm. Do you always intercede or do you have one plant out there and you continue to harvest? The way cranberries are planted is pretty unique. We only do a couple, we call them cranberry beds. We have 230 acres of cranberries total, but we divide them up into cranberry beds. So kind of like think of like a two to three acre plot is what we refer to as a cranberry bed. If we have a bed that is kind of reaching the end of its production life, we will replant that in the spring. So the way that we plant is the common way that we do it is we have a there's different varieties of cranberries as well kind of similar to apples they all taste the same but they kind of vary in size and shape and ripeness rate i guess so we have like an earlier variety just like a standard variety and then a later variety just depending so it can kind of stagger our harvest out so if we have a variety that we really like what we'll do is we'll go out and we'll just mow those vines right off so they grow on a low running vine wow Um, So we'll just mow those vines and then we'll go out with like a hay bale and then we'll just pick those vines up and 
compact them into a hay bale full of cranberry vines. Wow. And then we will dig up the old bed. We'll just rip out all those vines, dig up all of that soil that they're grown in and just put in new soil. And then we'll take those cranberry vines that we mowed off and we'll just kind of shake them over the sand, disc them in, put water, fertilizer on them, and they will regrow from those vine clippings. Wow. And then those clippings that we mowed off, those will also regrow within the next two years. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. They're a very efficient plant. After we replant, it takes about two to three years of growth for them to produce a sizable crop that we can actually get a harvest off of. So much of this is like, did I know that? And I'm thinking I've learned some of it over the year from Instagram following you. <laughs> so your channel is Cranberry Chats. I, I like that you put amber in cranberry yeah. <laughs> uh, as your hashtag, cranberry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really very good. That's amazing. So they're vines, they're not bushes. <laughs> We have the image of them all in water. Mm -hmm. Does water play much of a role the rest of the year? Only at harvest. And mostly at harvest is when we use large quantities of water, like like you're used to seeing. We use it out throughout the year. So like in the spring months. So after the fruit is harvested, the vines go dormant in the winter months. So in the winter months, we need to protect the vines because they are perennial. So right now we have buds developing for next season's crop. So we need to protect those vines and the way that we do that over winter is we'll actually flood those beds back up again. So we'll put like two feet of water on all of the beds, and then we wait for that water to freeze up so it forms a thick layer of ice. Mm -hmm. And once we have a few inches of ice, usually it takes about seven to ten days to get like a sturdy layer of ice. We'll pull any extra water off, and then that ice just kind of settles right on top of the vines. It actually protects the buds from any harsh elements and we'll do that a couple times throughout the winter just to build that ice up so it doesn't get any damage and then once that ice melts in the springtime and the vines start kind of waking up and coming out of dormancy those buds are really vulnerable to frost overnight so we'll actually use our irrigation system to irrigate the plants and just make sure that that water isn't freezing up on the buds or like that frost isn't sticking to the buds so that energy between the moving water helps keep the frost from sticking to the buds and to the vines. So it kind of keeps them protected in that sense. And then in the summer months, we also use water for just general irrigation purposes. So they require water just like any other plants. And we have a lot of water out here. We have a high water table. So all that water that we're using is kind of recycled and reused. So we're never letting water go to waste at all. So any water that we do use for like flooding purposes, it's always getting pulled back out and stored where it came from. That's really cool. One of the questions I always ask my family and friends, what questions, and even on the Facebook page and stuff, what questions people have for the kinds of farmers I'm interviewing. And one of them was asking about climate change and, you know, with different things going on with drought, different seasons. Right now we have these like fires going on in the West Coast and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of hard to predict what kind of weather we're going to have each year. Mm -hmm. That was why they were wondering about water. Are there other issues that you guys have for pests or other problems like that with cranberries? We, Since we are in kind of like a marshy, swampy area, we are more prone to bugs. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. we don't have like a lot that can destroy a crop by any means, but we do have some nasty nasty little critters out there that we have to take care of. So, a really cool thing that we can do like the flooding in the in the winter months that water hopefully will suffocate any eggs that were left throughout the summer or fall so we don't have to do quite as many treatments in the spring when they yeah. start to hatch. So, hopefully that water just kind of kills all the nasty bugs right away <laughs> and we don't have to worry about it too much. We also have a lot of spiders out here that can take care of the pests for us too. But we're pretty fortunate that we don't have <laughs> a lot of disease or, you know, a lot of insects that that really can affect the fruit. We also kind of have to be careful of the wildlife like white-tailed deer. We have a lot of geese out here that like to eat the fruit. So those are more pests to us than anything else. Yeah, I was thinking birds and stuff present such a tough issue for some berry crops or you know things because it gets bright red and people you know it's like attracts the animals mm -hmm. do you harvest cranberries like have you already harvested this year we're talking it's september have you already harvested not yet actually we are doing our early varieties i'm trying to check the calendar next 
Tuesday. So I think like the 15th, mid-September is when we'll kind of start our trial with our early fruit, okay. just to kind of work the kinks out before we start our fall harvest. And that usually runs from the entire month of October. So we try to finish up by Halloween. It's kind of like our deadline that we like to set because once you start getting into November, then it starts getting too cold to be out <laughs> out in the elements like that. So we like to finish up right around the end of October. Yeah. The only image I think Americans have of Cranberry Farms are two people standing in a field in an ocean spray right. commercial <laughs> talking. And there was, I can remember, like a ninja guy <laughs> and all kinds of different things. So is that just at harvest that you would see the berries up on water and, and farmers and waders? Do you go in the marsh like that? Yeah, so that only happens, that image is only during harvest. And the rest of the time, it's completely dry. I can walk out there in tennis shoes most of the time uh, in the summer and not have wet feet. What you see in the commercials, that's all during harvest. But we don't have chest waders like they see in the commercials. We just have hip boots. So not quite as stylish, but still <laughs> still just as functional. The, the only time that the berries are, are floating like that is during harvest. The rest of the time, they're kind of growing underneath a canopy of leaves. So they're just connected with a little stem and just hanging out <laughs> closer to the ground. So when they're floating in the water like that, as a, as a farmer, do you actually go out in the field to help move them towards a harvesting machine? I mean, I, I can't imagine you're like netting them all up or something. <laughs> so I'm going to try to explain this the best that I can. So if it's not making sense, just, just let me know. <laughs> the way that we start our harvest process is we start off by flooding the, the beds. So we put in six to eight inches of water, and then we have this cab tractor that has tracks instead of wheels on it. And this tractor has like these metal fingers on the front and on the back. So this tractor will drive in the bed and as he's driving along, these combs just gently just comb the berries right off the vines. And then once they're kind of off the vines and all the fruit is off the vines, we'll go back in and we'll add extra water on top of that. So we, in total, we have about two feet of water and we add that extra water to help those berries kind of come up out of the vines. So when we do corral them, they don't get stuck in there and we, we get all the fruit that we can. So once all of that water is on top, we have two tractors. So, so the shape of our cranberry beds is just like a long rectangle. We have these two tractors that have these big spools on the back of them. And on these spools, they have what we call a cranberry boom. So if you can imagine like that divider that you have in a pool where it kind of separates a shallow end from the deep end, like those floating, I don't know, like that floating rope type yeah. thing. It's kind of like that, but it's wrapped in like this waterproof material. And um, they come in 100 foot sections. You can hook these sections together. You determine, just kind of like looking at the crop size and you kind of determine how many feet of this boom that you need to corral everything without it being too tight or too loose. Huh. So it's a very, it's a very precise skill. <laughs> <laughs> these tractors will kind of back up to each other on the short end of the um, of the bed and one tractor will be stationary and the other tractor will pull that boom off of that reel of the opposing tractor hook it up to their tractor and both of the tractors have kind of like giant hair dryers that will blow in uh, towards the bed so the hair dryers just basically push all the fruit <laughs> <laughs> we'll just kind of push all the fruit into the in the middle of the bed so that they can slide that boom right alongside of the bed and then uh one tractor will start driving and it's just pulling this constant boom along until the other tractor driver kind of waves him off and says okay that's enough and then he'll unhook from his reel hook it up to his tractor and then he'll drive along the other side and then they'll just kind of meet in one corner and unhook that boom, stake it down into the ground, and move on to the next one. And then our fruit pickup crew will come along to the bed that they just finished corralling, and we have what's called a berry pump. And this is where it, it gets hard to explain because there's no other equipment like this out here. So I'm sorry if you don't have a good visualization. I'll be posting pictures soon, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that helps. But we have this berry pump, and it's basically just like this giant cart on wheels. It has like two levels to it. So there's a platform on the bottom that you can drive and then the upper platform that raises. It raises up to like 30 feet in the air, which is crazy. That's where I'm standing. This berry pump has like this metal arm that goes out. <laughs> do, 
yeah <laughs> this arm goes out into the water and on this arm it has kind of like this metal uh, box on top that has little sprayers that will blast into the water and then down below that box there's this little pan that acts as a vacuum so this arm will go out in the water and the pan sits underneath the water and the sprayers sit on top just like right over top of the water so when we start this up, it pushes water through that metal bar and it blasts the fruit that's sitting on top of the water. And that kind of self cleans the fruit. So it kind of knocks off all the leaves and sticks that kind of get stuck to the fruit. And then that pan will suck the fruit up out of the water. And then it travels all the way up to the top of this platform where I'm standing. And it goes up into like this big metal bin on top of this platform. And that fills up with water and fruit and it's still kind of self-cleaning all the way up there and then from that metal container up top it goes down kind of down at a slant and down that slant it has a metal grate on there yes and those metal grates are set just far enough apart so all that smaller fruit kind of falls through because we can't send in small fruit because it's, it just can't get used for anything. Right. So then all the larger fruit that doesn't fall through the cracks, it goes down into the back of a semi-trailer and that's what gets sent off into ocean spray. And then everything else, like any leaves or extra sticks or sometimes frogs, unfortunately, <laughs> they fall down those cracks and then they get shot off into the opposite end and goes into the back of a dump truck. Yeah. Um, so that's what we call our our trash truck is just all the leaves and sticks and stuff that we can't have okay and then we use that later for compost so my job standing on top of this berry pump is to make sure that the grates don't get backed up yep. um, like with any grass or anything because once that fruit starts to back up then it just turns into this whole big mess and we don't want that so and then i also kind of control i let the guys know down below when it's time to move that semi trailer ahead or when it gets full then i shut down everything and i start it back up whenever it's time to do so and then the guys down below they're pulling that cranberry boom in out of the water so there's a kind of a, a rotating reel down below that they wrap this boom around and then they just have to just physically pull that boom right out of the water until there's no boom left and then they make sure that all the fruit gets sucked up. So kind of a real quick overview. That's kind of harvest in a nutshell. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> it does. It does. And we're going to have videos that we can post in here that will help people. But I think part of the idea is, is so different than any other crop that we grow in the U.S. A lot of people have gone out and gone berry picking, mm -hmm. but cranberry picking is totally yeah. different. It's a little bit more labor intensive. But when you look at them, they don't look that different from... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, blueberries have a similar shape <laughs> and it's just so weird. Wow. I... I had no idea we were going to learn that much about cranberries in descriptive <laughs> language. I'm impressed because I'm going to make it for harvest next year. Good. Next year I will be traveling. <laughs> you mentioned that some of them go to ocean spray. Right. You know your cranberries go to ocean spray. Can you help me understand it? Is, is it a cooperative? Like, are you guys part owner? We are, yeah. That's a really cool thing. Ocean spray is a grower co-op. So it is owned by a lot of multi-general families like myself. I'm fifth generation out here on our family's marsh. And it's really hard not to find a multi-generational cranberry farm out here. Once you come out and you see what it's all about, you're going to understand why there are so many multi-generational families. It's so hard to leave. It's impossible to leave and never come back. It's just such a cool, unique industry. And there's so much pride that goes in to into this industry. So that's why you're going to be seeing a lot of new marketing from Ocean Spray really highlighting the growers. You're going to see us more on the back of like juice labels. You're going to see us on the back of craisins. So hopefully one day you'll be blessed with my face <laughs> on your cranberry juice or something. I don't know. Um, but it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> well, I have had friends on milk jugs and stuff. So I guess it's only good to to go there with cranberries I think that's <laughs> that's so interesting because most people think of ocean spray as like a food brand like mm -hmm. the the cranberries I have in my freezer right now because I buy some in winter knowing it's like they're not gonna just keep putting them out fresh and right. so but they're ocean spray cranberries good <laughs> thank you so they could have been grown by you 
they like put your her. family may be the ones that grows that would be cool yeah i mean when you tell people i could get cranberries yeah. <laughs> from amber when you tell people you can just tell them they're from me i will take credit for them <laughs> Can you tell me, since you guys are part of the cooperative, what else do you know about how they determine which ones are fresh? And Mm -hmm. is there a way, like, are different varieties better suited for the processing side or for the craisin side? Or yeah, so how does all that stuff work together? That's that's totally up to the grower what they want to grow. Our family, we just grow for processed fruit, so all of our stuff goes in for juices, sauce, craisins, that kind of thing. We don't do any fresh fruit. And that requires a completely different harvest type, I guess, than what we do. Since we do processed, we don't have to make the fruit look pretty necessarily. Yeah. It can be dinged up a little bit from our harvest practices. Whereas if you're doing fresh fruit, it has to be done in a completely different way. It has to be done a lot more gentle. It's a lot more labor intensive, I think, to do processed fruit than fresh fruit. So some growers, they have completely different varieties that are a little bit more hardy so they can withstand a harvest process and not have a a few nicks and and dings. I'm not totally confident on how they harvest. I know it involves boats and and different water practices, but it's weird. I don't know. You can look it up on YouTube, but... (laughs) We're going to pretend that it's like the crawfish. (laughs) That's really funny. It it may not be like crawfish. Um, But it it is interesting to think that you have to have different varieties. And Mm -hmm. it's the same in apples. So, you know, the apples that are cut up for a salad bar or for the little snack packs are different than the apples that I typically buy. It makes sense. But Mm -hmm. I I just wondered, like, so yours are processed. So as a child, I always had cranberry sauce that came out of the can and was frequently served in the shape of the cranberry can. Yeah, us too. We love it. (laughs) What's your favorite way to eat cranberries or drink cranberries or whatever? Growing up, I always had cranberry juice. It's just a necessity in our house. So all juices I love, obviously, but my grandma makes a really good cranberry sauce. And I'm not, I'm no cook by any means. Like ask, like when I go to family gatherings, they ask me to bring a fruit salad, like just cut up a watermelon, pineapple. Be lucky (laughs) if I come there with all my fingers, honestly. (laughs) If I am in the kitchen, it needs to be something pretty easy. But my grandma makes a really good cranberry sauce. I have the recipe right in front of me. Let me just whip it out. Oh my goodness. So it's four cups of fresh fruit. I came prepared today. <laughs> so this is coming from my cranma. That's what I call her on <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> I love it. I've got all the cran names. Just, <laughs> just as an FYI. So it's four cups of fruit, two cups of sugar, one cup of liquid of your choice. We usually use orange juice to add a little zing. And then you just put that in a 9 by 13 cover it up with foil. You can add like cloves or cinnamon or anything that you want to it. And then you just bake it for an hour at 350 and the fruit will stay whole. So it's really pretty to serve. So you still have the nice round berries in there. They don't pop or shrivel up like a lot of other, like a blueberry would necessarily. So it just stays like this really pretty round red cranberry sauce we love it it's super tasty wow well i'm gonna get that recipe written down you're gonna send me a photo of it so i can put it on the blog i'm gonna also share my mother's favorite cranberry recipe which makes my family go nuts and it is one that you boil on top of the stove so you do want to pop the cranberries with pineapple juice and then you put in sugar we do like sugar i like the tartness of cranberries but some sugar in there helps too A little bit of gelatin, Mm -hmm. some pecans, and some Mm -hmm. crushed pineapple. And it's, oh my God, good. But I also like craisins and salads. Yes, me too. And things like that. Anytime with salads or oatmeal. Craisins are also really good to bake with as well. Like I mentioned, like I'm not knocking blueberries in any way, shape, or form. Don't don't get me wrong. I love blueberries, but... They have a place. Yeah, they they have a place. place, But in muffins and in breads, uh, they bleed. So if you're looking for something, a fruit that's, if you're looking for a fruit that's similar, go with a cranberry. Yeah. It's going to make everything look prettier. (laughs) I like it. You know, last year I had something I had not had before, and that was a cranberry wine kind of punch Mm. that was amazing. It was at a nice gift shop over on the other side of the river, 
And I'm going to have to see if I still have that recipe because I made it last year. It was kind of like a sangria almost, okay. but made Yum. with cranberries. Count me in. Oh, that sounds good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was good. It's a little gift shop called Fezzy Wigs. Fezzy Wigs so- uh, sold it last year, and they only have it around the holidays, a special wine. I'm one of those people who just love it. What is the biggest use of cranberries? Like, is it juice or craisins? Yeah, up until recently, it was juice for a really long time. That was just kind of like our go-to thing. We didn't really branch out into many other areas, I guess, just because juice was so popular. And now that everyone's kind of on a health kick, not that that's a bad thing, but that's great for us because cranberries are considered super fruit. They're very low in sugar. They're high in antioxidants. They're proven great for gut health. Everyone knows them for like urinary tract issues. So they're they're great for every aspect of your body. So we're starting to incorporate that more into different food options. So you're going to be seeing a lot more like granola with cranberries in them or cereals or I just recently saw cranberry dental floss because they've been proven great for gum health even. And I saw pet company come out with like like this liquid that you can put into dog's water or something like um, to add like immunity health and gut health for your dogs. Like people take better care of their pets than themselves. So go ahead, like buy all this stuff for your pets. So, yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> But there's also a 100% pure cranberry juice that I buy quite frequently for my smoothies in the morning um, because it is a very low sugar, so I can just add that in instead of water or orange juice or something. So I use that as my liquid base for my smoothies, and I love it. It's an easy way to get in extra vitamins, and it tastes great. If, if, you're, if you like that pucker, yeah. that pucker power, that's a good alternative. Yeah, I think that's interesting because a lot of us have... Cranberry cocktail juices are pretty common, right? Like cran apple Mm -hmm. or something. But I haven't thought about 100% cranberry. Like, I'm not even sure I've ever had that. Like, that would be a tartness to it for sure. But as a start for something like smoothies, smart. Yeah, if you do buy it, don't... uh pour a big glass of it take take like a shot at a time if you can do apple cider vinegar shots or if you can do grass shots you can do a shot of <laughs> this this cranberry juice <laughs> i never understood grass shots so <laughs> please don't come after me for knocking <laughs> i am i am picturing people lined up at the bar getting their use it as a vodka chaser off. i don't know whatever you want to do that's fine yeah <laughs> it's a, quite an image mm-hmm Well, there are quite a few alcoholic drinks that are made with cranberry (laughs) juice. And one of our friends, Leah, that has a blog, Farm Wife Drinks, I'm sure she's going to have some recipes there too. (laughs) So it will all come together ultimately. Mm -hmm. When we buy cranberries, you guys are harvesting them now. Those will be the ones that are in the markets in October, November, December. Yeah, (laughs) that's that's it. (laughs) That's what you're going to be seeing coming up in the markets pretty soon. And cranberries, they are great to freeze once, but they're not great to freeze twice. So that's why you don't see them in the supermarkets much past like February, because we want to make sure that the consumers are getting the best product possible. And we know that you as a consumer are going to be freezing them later on just to keep them throughout the year. So we want to make sure that after you freeze them, that they're still going to be a great quality fruit. We don't want you to freeze them and then have us freeze them and then you freeze them again. And then when you take them out, they're going to be a little bit mushy compared to if you just froze them the one time. So that's why they, they don't have a great shelf life. It's like any other fruit or vegetable. They don't, they don't keep well on the shelf, obviously, and they don't freeze well twice. So unfortunately, that's why it's a little bit harder to find fresh fruit all year round. Yeah, no, it, it's a great seasonal product then, right? Like, you know you're getting fresh product in season. And then you have juices year-round and craisins year-round that are easily, you know, kind of easily stored. Mm-hmm. So I have no idea if you know this, so you can tell me no. <laughs> I buy fresh ones, and then I put them in the freezer. Mm-hmm. Should I be, like, putting those in, like, a zip pack, you know, so that it pulls all the air out? 
Mm -hmm. Because cranberries are kind of sturdy. So what we like to tell people is when you get a bag of cranberries to wash them off, go through them, make sure that if you do happen to get a bad one that you get rid of it. Lay them flat out on a paper towel to dry and then we just put them in like a freezer Ziploc bag and then they will keep in your freezer for like a year or so. But if you just have them in your crisper, they will keep for like six to eight weeks as well. So just make sure that you're cleaning them, drying them off. Don't put them in wet. We we think they last longer and better in, a, in like a freezer Ziploc than just in like the plastic bag that they come in. Yeah. <laughs> I'll always do better. See if, learn a little bit, always put it into practice. There you go. And then that way, if I'm doing that in the winter months, if I'm getting them and washing them, nicely freezing them, I'll have some so I can add them into my muffins even in the summer Mm -hmm. or add them in with some yogurt in the summer. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you freeze them in small bags, you can take those smaller bags out and have some available off and on forever. Right. (laughs) There you go. I mean, part of it is the idea of trying to get more fresh fruits and vegetables and frozen fruits and vegetables and juices in people overall, right? Like most of us need more fruits and vegetables. Any ways that you can do to kind of encourage that helps. Yes, definitely. I know I need help with that a lot. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) It really is. And you get tired of the same thing over and over. Right. So add some cranberries in there to to spice it up a little bit. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So Amber, if folks want to follow you, I know Instagram is the best place to find you. I'm going to let you give them your handle so we'll find it and we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, you can find me over at Instagram at Cranberry Chats. I also just kind of started on Facebook too, mostly for my my older relatives that aren't savvy on Instagram. Cranberry Chats over there as well. Perfect. And recently you and another farmer friend started a podcast. Oh, yeah. You want to tell people what that is? Definitely. I started a podcast with a fellow Wisconsin dairy farmer here in Wisconsin, and it's called Forward Farming, and we talk about all things Wisconsin agriculture because the cranberry is Wisconsin state fruit, and milk is the official beverage of Wisconsin, so we thought it would be fun to kind of team up and just talk all things Wisconsin ag from a female perspective. So we laugh a lot over there and just tell goofy stories. So if you're interested, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Forward Farming Podcast, and you can find our podcast on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. In all places, right? That's what you have to be if you're a podcast. You have to be everywhere. Right. Is there anything I missed asking you about in Cranberries? <laughs> I think we about covered everything. That was that was pretty quick. That was fun. <laughs> See, I try and shoot for like 30 minutes, maybe 45 on some. But, you know, you think about the average commute time of a person. So, Amber, thanks so much for joining me. I loved having you on the show, and I can tell you, this is going to be the talk of Thanksgiving as we're all enjoying our cranberry salads. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Amber was so much fun to talk to. Don't forget, check out the recipes and all on groundedbythefarm.com. You'll see the links in the show notes. See some photos and stuff there as well, but tell your friends folks who also love food and like to know more about where it came from and how it's grown as well as sort of the insider's look from those farmers who grow it. Next up in our series we have two more holiday foods coming. We have sweet potatoes and we have corn, another Native American food. Thanks so much. This is Janice. We'll talk to you soon.